leave Indiana and go to Brooklyn, and all of a sudden Brooklyn jump off. What's <laughs> what's, what's up with that, man? I mean, people Bro. aren't connecting those dots. I'm connecting the dots, like literally, <laughs> literally. It's great. It's you know, I never envisioned that it was something like this. You know what happened? Um, yeah, you did. You started music. coming. And we and look, we we can we we're gonna get into a music conversation too. But okay. I felt a connection with Brooklyn um, before I ever stepped foot in a borough. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And music and a number of variety of reasons played a role in that. So okay. uh, there were a number of factors why I decided to leave Indiana and family and that whole situation, the comfort of that situation to go to Brooklyn. But fam, there were 20 wins team at that. I know <laughs> that that's okay. You, you saw something and none of us, you saw something none of us did. You knew. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know this too. Uh, and and I forget who said this, but once the Nets get a star, once they get that dude, it's over. Yeah. Like Brooklyn's cultural relevance. You know, I know it's cold and dudes love the L.A. vibe and that type of thing. Nah, but you're right. Brooklyn's re relevance with the culture uh, means something, I feel. Oh, it means something and, it's, it, big time, especially when in a basketball sense, the Knicks aren't doing well. <laughs> well, seriously, that's, that's real stuff. So once right. they left, once they dropped Jersey, you know, and inherited Brooklyn as their namesake, that changed the entire culture of the franchise. You know, and you know, now you add to the fact that Brooklyn, you know, not only just to the basketball culture is one of the meccas, but you add the fact that you have a team now that it can claim from on a professional level with the name, but also a team in a space that's vying for some attention because the cats up, you know, the cats in Manhattan aren't doing anything. The cats in Manhattan have been irrelevant for too long. So now the focus is on you in a bit and, and, and it extends it to the basketball community, but in Brooklyn, it goes beyond that. It's, it's the New York community, it's the entire black cultural community, not just in the New York area, but nationally because we're all somehow connected to Brooklyn. You know what I'm mm. saying? Just, we're all, mm. especially black folks, because of what Brooklyn means and what it represents. There's always some black cultural connectivity to Brooklyn. It's, it's always there, you know? So whether you've been to the borough or not, you feel a sense of connectivity. So you bring all that to the fold. I understand, you know, why a brother like you, you know, <laughs> when the opportunity came left to go from Indiana to Brooklyn, but I'm just saying from a straight up basketball standpoint, what it happening in Brooklyn basketball wise, you get there and all of a sudden it's like flashlight. Yeah, yeah, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> I, I like um, equating things that we see in the sports world, which we which we glamorize for sure, with just like everyday life, um, yeah. everyday jobs. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, uh, for me to have a successful show, for me to have a successful broadcast, like it means something to me to, to you know to make moves or whatever it may be. It may it, it means something. You know, right. Kobe Kobe does, just doesn't inspire basketball players. He he inspires lawyers inspires, you know, people in, in a number of different fields. And, and I, I found myself inspired by a number of different people. Um, you being such an amazingly successful journalist, let's go back, you know, your, your father was, you know, a journalist. Was this something that you knew was, you were destined to do from an early age? No, not at all, man, <laughs> <laughs> not at all. You know, my father was the first black newspaper reporter in the city of Chicago. Wow. He was from the first 10 in the country. And uh, I learned earlier, what I did learn earlier on, Michael, was the separation between what reporting is and what journalism is. Mm -hmm. And even though the, you know, the lines get blurred and they do marry, they, they are to a certain degree married to each other, but reporting of being a reporter falls under the umbrella of being a journalist. And when I would watch my father or see my father or had a great understanding of what my father did, and watch it from the outside because he covered the civil rights movement. And, you know, he, he covered all the, the, the riots in 1968 in Chicago. And, you know, he was always on the road in marches dealing with Ralph Abernathy and Dr. King and mm -hmm. uh, 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 just, you know, every, you know, Byron Russert and, you know, we can go down and name all the leaders, you know, and his involvement in it, especially one of being a, one of the only black reporters on there, his access and his, and his ability to, to report and what was going on in the front lines, I saw that. But what I also saw was how reporters attack stories. 
And in attacking stories, a lot of in attacking stories, a lot of times you're attacking human beings. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that always bothered me. Uh, so watching my father as a reporter, I never wanted to be a reporter because in chasing news, you invaded the privacy of individuals. And as a young individual trying to really grasp on what reporting and being a newspaper reporter was, I never connected to that because I've, I, I always saw it as you're not giving people space. Mm. Like my thing was like, if this person has a story to tell, then they should be allowed to tell the story at least on their own terms. So them, you know, rushing people at the courthouse, you know, rolling up and staking out somebody outside their homes, you know, just the whole microphone, camera, tape recorder thing, just rushing on people and catching them, like in whatever vulnerable moment they happen to be or whatever, you know, going through people's kids, just all the stuff I, you know, you saw reporters and that's part of their job. That's what they do. Trying to get a quote, trying to get a story. I couldn't connect with that. But the craft of writing that story, I always connected to. Mm -hmm. And watching my father craft that story. And my mother was, you know, she was an educator, but she was a phenomenal writer. And watching my mother craft stories and reading Alex Haley early on and reading Nelson George thoroughly when I was in college, all those things gave me a greater understanding of journalism. Mm -hmm. You know, but it wasn't directly related to my father being a reporter because I never wanted to be a reporter. I never wanted to go about getting information in that way. Uh, so I, you know, I appreciated and understood his craft of writing and, and, and telling the stories that he was reporting on. But that, that wasn't the thing that got me interested. That, that wasn't the quote unquote bug that led me to lean into being a journalist. You know, but it took what? me a long time to understand the difference between being a reporter and being a journalist. It's not like, it's not like this is something that was taught to me in school. This is not something that, you know, I sat down and, you know, had discussions with, with my father about trying to get into this, that, and the other. I was trying to get a whole bunch of things, you know, and writing just, you know, as I got older, I started to really appreciate the craft of writing, you know, and the ability to tell stories, you know, and that comes from like, you know, reading, like I said, from Nelson George to Alex Haley, to Gary Smith and Sports Illustrated, to Ralph Wiley, you know, reading some cast and be like, oh, so it doesn't have to all be just this way, mm. you know, and, and you're reading different ways that people are weaving tales and, and also listening that we will speak about it later, but listening to music and looking at, you know, uh, advertising and looking at television shows and watching movies and understand that all of that starts with writing. You know what I'm saying? It's not just all, it's not, acting doesn't start from somebody, you know, putting a camera on you, telling you to, act it starts with a script somebody has to write that you know advertise i learned one of the greatest story people always ask what got me into this in in, in school i was studying uh, i double majored in college political science and mass communications once again not wanting not knowing i just love communications you know i want to be a radio dj i want i want <laughs> no no not necessarily i want to be a dj but i want to be a radio program director Cause I wanted okay, to take because I because I I thought I knew more music than most of the program directors I was hearing across the country. <laughs> like y'all don't know y'all don't know music. I know music, so that was always my thing. And then in one class, uh, I forgot what exact class it was, but Dr. Kent, who was over the communications department at Xavier University, I said to him, "You know, I want to get in advertising." He said, "Okay." So what he did, man, he literally walked up to my desk and put a paper clip on my desk, and he said, "All right, tomorrow I want you." Well, it was you know Monday. Wednesday, Friday. So, you know, next class, I want you to give me, I want you to make me cry over this paperclip. I need you to write me something that makes me cry over this paperclip. I'm like, okay, all right, cool, whatever. I didn't understand what he was having me do. So I sat there and I, and I literally came back to the next class like, I got nothing. I like, I don't understand. I never understood what he was talking about. And he explained to me, cause I'm like 19, 20 years old. You know, I don't know any better. And he's like, you say you wanted to get into advertising. He's like, your ass is probably sitting at home watching TV and saw a commercial and thought you could do that. That's not advertising. Advertising is me taking something like a paperclip and asking you to make me why I need this paperclip in my life. I have to be emotionally connected to this paperclip. Mm. You have to make me want to buy, spend money on this paperclip. That's what advertising is. And I was mm. like, oh, okay. <laughs> and but no, but 
it came from writing. His whole thing, you have to write to make me do this. And that's when I really got an understanding of how, what writing was and the role writing plays in everything that we do from a communication standpoint. That's fascinating to hear you say that, Scoop, because um, and the similarities, you know, with, with, with me, I wanted to be a, ra a radio DJ myself. Okay. Love music, so fascinated with hip hop. And as I, uh, the one thing that I will, that really stuck with me and I feel like everything that I experienced and everything that I witnessed and everything that I tried to do growing up influenced where I'm at, you know, right now. And music played a big role in that. That's the beauty of uh, what we contribute to society from a cultural standpoint. Um, you know, and I feel the same way about hip hop the way you do. And, you know, it's not just the words that are delivered by someone like, like Nas. It's the thought process from my standpoint to put those words down down on paper and not only make them rhyme, but make them make sense. Mm. You know, a lot of people can rhyme, but that don't mean it makes sense. <laughs> right, right. You know what I'm saying? But that's why, you know, we love cats like Nas. We love Chuck D. We love Ice Cube. We love Kendrick. You know what I'm saying? We love cats that put words together that not only rhyme, that not only find that cadence that you just spoke to, but they yeah. also make us think and they don't, they make more sense below the surface than just being on the surface. Mm. When did you, when did you know that you loved music? Like not, you know, early memories of music or whatnot, but when did you realize, oh snap, I, I love music? I have an answer for that, but I'll try to give you artists, but it happened when I was young mm. and you have to understand this. My mother was, my mother had like acute glaucoma mm -hmm. and she was legally considered blind uh, as, a, as a kid. Most of my, I think maybe since second grade, I think she was legally considered blind starting in my second grade maybe, okay? So basically my childhood, I had to deal with my mother dealing with that, right? And I can't put a date on it, but I realized at one point I love music when I, in my mind, speaking to myself, I was in my bedroom, you know, when, when I, I remember that happened. I can't remember what date or anything. When I was like, I'd rather be blind than deaf because I'd rather be able not to see basketball than hear music. Ooh. And that's the only, that's the only thing that kept me like, you know, because I'm watching my mother having to deal with a sight situation, you know what I'm saying? But I'm yeah. like, I'd rather deal with what she's dealing with than to not be able. And it wasn't hearing people talking or anything because it was sign language. Over here. My whole thing was like, I can't not hear music. That's the trump card for me. You know mm. what I'm saying? Music then became, that's when I knew music had held a, a ridiculous place inside of me when, you know, that binary decision had to be made on if you had to either go blind or go deaf which one would you choose and i chose <laughs> going blind because i couldn't i couldn't i couldn't even fathom my life not hearing music you know one of the greatest contributions of of of, of, of society we've ever had is funk music mm. you know because everybody from like it's not just george clinton it's cameo it's prince you know what i'm saying it's kim yep. lamar the root of what funk is and you know come on man I can't hear Stanley Clark play bass. I can't hear Bootsy play bass. <laughs> you mean I, can play, I can't listen to Maggie Breen. You know, I can't listen to Brothers, you know, all the stuff that came from the funk era and everything that George Clinton does and still does, it has impact to this day. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about hip hop, half of hip hop's whole origin comes from James Brown. <laughs> right. You know, and then, and then after that, it's That's George Clinton. You know, so all, all the music we're hearing in hip hop lent itself because of what James Brown and George Clinton created and shaped as funk music. So mm -hmm. imagine not being able just to hear that. You know what I'm saying? Now, yes, you would have lost seeing Michael Jordan play basketball. But to me, I can't, I can't not hear James Brown. I cannot not hear Stevie Wonder. I cannot mm -hmm. not hear, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Miles Davis, I cannot not hear George Clinton and Bootsy 
Parliament Funkadelic and Cameo and the Fatback Band and Lakeside and Confunk. You know, I, dude, don't get me started. And no doubt. And I, I, I say this without hesitation. Like, I, I would not be where I am right now if it wasn't for music. Um, and it inspired me at a young, at a young age, got me through, you know, rough days. Um, you know, people talk about like, you know, the arrogance in hip hop or whatever, the, or, you know, rapping about being the best or whatever it may be. Fam, I had some days at the radio station where, you know, there weren't many people, you know, black faces Yes. and just feeling like I was, um, you know, small. And just before I get ready to walk in, I put, Soundtrack you know, time. Yep. Put, yeah, soundtrack, soundtrack time, time. and yep. it just puts me in a, in a mental space where I'm not, I'm unconcerned with people's opinions and I'm locked into the task at hand because I know, I know I'm supposed to be here. Yep. You know what I mean? People may walk past me as if, oh, who's he? Or he's not supposed to be here or who's this? But it just put me in a mind, it just put me in a mind frame. And yeah. so it was, it was therapy, it was motivation, it was a number of different things to where if I didn't, if I didn't have that extra oomph, you know what I mean? And for me, you know, we talked about this, you know, growing up in a single parent household, you know, my dad was not there. And uh, my grandfather was very instrumental in my life. The, you know, I had, I had men in my life who were, who were terrific, but um, that extra oomph, that extra something, you know what I mean? Uh, music really like, really pushed me through in so many, so many different, different areas. And Mike, I can say this, it was also the genre of music. It wasn't just the music we just got through speaking of. It's specifically yeah. directed at hip hop and that arrogance. And my mother always told me, you know, a black man without arrogance in this country. And I, mm. and that that is, that's biblical truth. You know, so you being a young man and hip hop being an art form that was feeding itself to your soul. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You have to, yeah. I, I, as, as much as it did for you, I think, and I'm, tell me if I'm wrong, it also made you feel that you weren't alone. Yeah. Because other, it wasn't point. your voice that you were hearing. It was somebody else's, you know, braggadocio. Mm -hmm. it, it, was, it, was, it was their arrogance that you were hearing that validated the way you needed to feel. Yes. So it wasn't just you. You knew you had an entire community that was feeling the same way that you were feeling and feeling the way you needed to feel in order to get where you were going. And that yes. validated you like, oh, I'm good. What are these last, what, what are we now? Seven, eight months? What, what, have, what have they been like for you? How have your eyes been opened in any way? How have things been you know, reaffirmed in your eyes uh, over the course of this you know, last six, seven months? Man, for me, Michael, to be honest with you, man, it's been a struggle. Uh, and, and not the type of struggle that I think uh, many people would understand in that um, my eyes have not been open to anything. You know, most people at work, you know, like I said, most people are woke. I'm wide awake, then wide awake. <laughs> you know, maybe too wide awake. I haven't slept. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> you woke, I ain't slept. So um, that's been different. And and I, it, it's been a struggle for me to accept. It's been, to be honest, it's been a struggle for me to accept being heard. Because it's exactly to the core of your question is, why haven't you heard me before? Hmm. And... I've been, you know, I've been accused of being that person in this industry since I entered into this industry, you know, and I've kind of entered it. I, I'm one of the few individuals that entered into this industry independently on my own accord. And I'm one of the few that have had that, you know, so I've been accused because of that. And because I haven't had to uh, I use Stephen A's word, acquiesce, <laughs> you know, a certain way as I've navigated my way through this business for the last 25 years, I haven't had to acquiesce to being something that I don't believe in or some, somebody that conforms in order to reach a certain place. So my viewpoint on this entire situation is rooted to who I am. Because as I've been accused of this, I also own it. Like the same stuff that we are talking about now, I was writing about and talking about in 1991. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing this periodically 
since 1991. You know, so why all of a sudden, in the words of Kanye, why am I getting moved to the front of the store? Mm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know mm. the look I'm talking about. But Kanye's working at the Gap. Oh, yep. Kanye all up in front of the, right, exactly. So yep. why now, uh, the word, why am I at the front of the store now? Why 30 years of doing this am I at the front? And that's, it's hard to deal with. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's hard to deal with. And it's hard to deal with um, accepting the fact that other black individuals coming to the forefront, acting like they've been here for 30 years when they haven't. <laughs> Mm. You know mm. what I'm saying? And dealing yep. with that. And we're in a situation now where we where, where for the first time in at least our generation, you know, I believe black folks have been listened to, but this is the first time we're being heard. One, you know, we can't remove ourselves from the history of this country and think that, you know, we're gonna be heard forever. You know, we got heard in the 60s, but we got heard for a short amount of time. You know, so now I'm in a stage like how long is this gonna last? Yeah, we're right, 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 right. How long like we right fad we're in vogue right now? Right, so right, we're in vogue right now. This is sexy right now. It's cute right now. When is this gonna snap back to another to, to the regular white reality that we've been living all this time? You know, so when you ask a question, what has opened my eyes over the last seven months? What are my eyes? My eyes are not open to it, nothing that it hasn't already been to. It's just now I'm more at the conflict as to why. And the conclusion I have is that there's always strength in numbers when it comes to anything in this country. And for, you know, since the 60s, we haven't had the numbers. And what happens in this particular case is that it takes, as it always does with us as Black Americans, it takes tragic events on an uh, uh, unreturnable level Mm -hmm. for us to be heard. And once we're heard, we're only heard because the numbers are so vast. We don't become a fringed voice. So we have black individuals who decided throughout their careers in this lane that we're in called sports media or whatever, when we occasionally decide to tell stories that are rooted in race or rooted in injustice, our voices become fringe. But when something happens, a tragic event that affects our entire race and our entire numbers come behind that. And then you got a part of white America that understands over a period of time, it's almost like water torture. The water breaks and they, oh, I finally get what they've been saying for the last 30, it, it hits me now. When you add that to the mix, now those numbers are strong enough for us to be heard. And that's why the change is happening now because now, it's not just Scoop Jackson. It's not just Mike Grady. It's not just Stuart Scott. It's not just Jamel Hill. It's not just Stephen A. Smith. You know, it's, it's you know, it's not, you know, whoever. You, we can name all type of names of people in this industry, you know, who, you know, who, who, who have lent their voices to what injustices have occurred in sports, have occurred in America, have occurred in society, have occurred directly towards us, have occurred to this industry that we've said over the course of all of our careers, now that it's not just us, we're not fringe anymore. Now it's all of us, you know, because everybody seems to be in on this because now the numbers are great. But to me, that's not, I can't speak for you, but that's not my eyes waking up. Yeah. That's me like, okay, the reason it's happening now is because now numbers are in. And usually when it comes to things in this country, and we could direct this to like the Me Too movement, it's the numbers give you a safe space where you didn't have that type of safety before. And my biggest problem with that is that everybody speaks to having uncomfortable conversations. When are they gonna translate that into living unsafe in order to get things done? Because in my mind, the way we have been treated as black individuals in our existence in this country, has not changed at all. It's getting exposed a little bit more, but it hasn't changed. So while I've been out here since 1991 and you've been out here and there's a whole lot of other brothers and sisters been out here doing this, you know, all this time, why am I supposed to like be open arms with you all now? Mm -hmm. When we did the unsafe travel. Mm 
here's the thing before like people throw their hands up and be like oh well forget it then like it's okay yeah it's okay like, it's you'll fine. never it's understand fine. it's so it's so it's okay fine. right it's fine don't you know don't act like you have a complete full understanding because that's that's impossible the stories that you know your parents told you the things that you've experienced the stories that you know your parents parents told you you know my uh, experience with what my mom you know had to go through the, the stories that my grandparents still tell me you know to this day it's just different yeah and that's so that's okay that you can't be you know you know, put yourself in our shoes or have a full understanding, but it's just the under, it's just the understanding that you it's don't, the, that you can't. But Michael, it's the respect. It's the I'm respect. I'm not asking you to put yourself it's in my respect. shoes. I'm asking you to respect the fact that I have shoes. And my mm. shoes are just as good as yours. That's the problem mm. we have. I don't mind you being white. I don't mind you being whatever. I don't care. All we're asking for is respect who we are. Not respect who you want us to be. Mm. Expect who we are. You just said the stories your mother tells, stories your grandma. Michael, those aren't stories. Those are things you still carry with you. Mm. And they need to understand that all of that is in us. Yes, it's because of you all that we got to carry this. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but these aren't just stories. This is all inside of me. So all, all we're saying, and I'm not, I was about to use the word asking, which is the wrong word to ask. All we're saying is respect that. That's all. Respect it for everything that it is. Don't minimize it. Don't diminish it. Don't reject it. Don't dismiss it. Respect it for what it is, and we'll be fine. Yeah. yeah really, that's all yeah. it is. But and here's the here's problem, man, is that in this country, though, respect and getting that type of respect comes with them relinquishing power. And that is the most impossible thing that can happen in America. No doubt, no doubt. Pump the book again. Uh, oh yeah, the game is not a game. Uh, the politics, protest, and power of American sports. Uh, it was released last year in March. Still available for, through Haymarket Books and Amazon and all this and the other, but Haymarket is the publisher and um, you know, it was one of those books that I finished writing. Um, I finished writing it in 2018. It wasn't published. You know, we did some remixes in 2019. Um, it didn't get published until 2020. And it's, you know, one of those unique situations where um, the stuff that I wrote about and was writing about and focused the book about in 2018 came to a front in 2020 with all the civil and social unrest that we had to deal with because it's looking at America through the lens of sports and the power that sports has in every different way of life, really. And you'd I, I end this on you'd appreciate this because I wrote the book and this is, this is for real, for real. This is no BS, this is for real, for real. I wrote the book wanting it to be in structure and tone and deliverance as Nas's Illmatic album. Get out. That was, <laughs> I, seriously, it was nine. It was nine chapters, just like nine songs. You say as an introduction, nine yep. songs, all diverse, none of them sounding the same, but sequenced beautifully. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And absolutely. when I when I when I submitted the book to the publisher, that was our conversation. I'm like, this is what, this is Nas's album, Illmatic, is what this. I want this book to be Nas's version of Illmatic. That's it. <laughs> and they loved it, but then they were like, Scoop, there still needs to be, there's a couple more stories you need to get into. So that's why it's like 13 chapters. Now I had to add four more. But I really <laughs> wanted to be, like Nas's album is tight. There's no jumping chapters, no jumping, it's like, you know what I'm saying? So you yep. talked about Nas earlier and I just had this, I thought it was like <laughs> fitting that, you know, you ask about the book and really the whole, and to use Beyonce's word, formation of the book is rooted in Nas's Illmatic. Man, I love it, I love it. And uh, I appreciate you, man. And uh, my brother, we have to do this again. <laughs> <laughs>